Um, 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 yes, as um, Sabrina kindly mentioned, my name is Bernadine Brocker, and I'm the founder and managing director of thestari.com. Um, we're constantly working with beautiful things, with museums and with private collectors to help um, communicate ideas within the art world. Um, and even though I'm working with art every day, I'm still surprised about the type of numbers and the type of values that the art world is constantly facing. Um, I'm sure you might have heard about the increases in auction results and all the um, high prices. And it makes me start thinking about where this is coming from and why these works of art are as valuable as they are. Um, this is uh, Paul Cezanne's card players. It was um, sold in, uh, uh, in 2012, reputedly for 250 million. Um, if you ask me as an art historian why this work is important, I have quite a lot to say. I mean, Cezanne creates tension with his composition. He's talking about the everyday. He's talking, uh, he's using his paint in a way that is revolutionary for its time. All of these visual things are quite important. But at the end of the day, when I think about it, those visual things don't justify that increase in, in value. So it's still just an oil on canvas. It's not anything more than that. So I asked some people, um, I did a bit of a survey, to find out how they think about art. I um, asked them to think about their favorite work and then imagine that it disappears and how you would describe it to someone. And the three things that they um, mentioned, oh sorry, um, sorry. The three things that they mentioned was usually the artist's name, uh, also the context in which they saw it, whether it was a gallery catalog, a museum, and then potentially the title of the work if they could remember. These are all words that are constantly in the dialogue of art history. Let me go back here. Um, we all agree on the trajectory of art history and who's important. We learn about the Renaissance classicism uh, in Art History 101 and how it's countered by mannerist exaggeration and emotion. We then learn about the Baroque in the 17th century and how they go back to classicist ideals and people like Louis XIV um, were extremely uh, grand and, and impactful with their designs. And then you go to the era of the Rococo when everything becomes more intimate and more personal. So everyone agrees on what's important, but what is making these specific works so impressive? And it's beyond the visual, it's actually the words that are used revolving around the works of art that create that value. So I'll start with the artist. Um, I believe that it's not just about the name of the artist, it's also about the anecdotal stories revolving around an artist's existence that are told throughout the centuries that make you relate to the artist and creates value. Um, one of my favorite anecdotal writers of art history is Giorgio Vasari. He was a 16th century art historian who wrote about Michelangelo, Raphael, um, a lot of the important Italian Renaissance painters. Sorry. Um, and his stories were so uh, intimate. You found out that um, Michelangelo was actually a terrible person to work with, even though he was a genius. Um, you find out that Giotto uh, proved his skill as an artist by drawing a perfect circle without a compass. Um, you find out that Raphael actually um, died when he was 47 in the throes of passion with reputedly this woman. Um, she's a baker's daughter, and uh, she was known as the Fornarina. And he, that suddenly changes the way you look at the artist and changes the way that you feel when you look at their work. Um, so these anecdotes are actually the reason that these people keep coming, uh, everyone keeps coming back to these people. This particular work is quite interesting. Um, Raphael is using a circular composition. It's 
quite um, interesting visually, but the story behind it that ke ke keeps being told um, for generations is that Raphael was walking through a forest and drew it on the top of a beer barrel. Um, and that's what showed that he was a genius. And a quick Google image search of auctions with the same title shows um, a lot of works. Sorry, I think this is because it's image heavy, that it's slow. Um, there you go. Um, you can actually see that there are so many people throughout the centuries who have imitated this, Im this um, composition. And there's even a lady who said that she believes this work should be in every hospital around the world because it's so moving. So you suddenly feel that there's so much more behind it than just the visual narrative. There's words that have been accumulated over the centuries by people to create the value. Um, next is context. Context can be a variety of things. I'm going to focus on two specific instances. The first is how the artist can, puts themselves within art history, and then how subsequent generations look at the artist. Um, when, we look, when I say how an artist puts himself into art history, I mean that quite literally. They use words to make themselves important. Um, this is uh, also by Raphael, the School of Athens. It's a, a painting of all the important Greek philosophers that's in the Vatican in Rome. He puts Plato and Aristotle in the middle, and he actually um, quotes Aristotle at the top. It's kind of a little, um, you can't see it in this image, but he has a, a quote from Aristotle on the top. He's putting himself into that conversation. He's saying, I am actually on the same level as these guys, and I'm talking with them. And it's something that keeps happening. Um, Cy Twombly, in 1964, does the same thing. He, this is also called the School of Athens. And it actually really clearly um, says School of At Athens, 1964, at the top. So he's doing the same thing. He's saying, I'm in conversation with Raphael, and I'm in conversation with the Greek philosophers. I'm on par, and I'm going to keep being in conversation with them. And it worked. He's a very well-sold artist now. So it's the words that he's using that create the value behind the piece of art. Yeah, there's next to each other. Um, and then context can actually be um, where you see the works as well. Of course, Raphael working in the Vatican contextualizes the work of art as something valuable. And so, Sai Twombly, his works are in the most important museums around the world. All of a sudden, that context and those people who are writing about the works of art creates value. The last is title. Oh, it's going to go straight to that wonderful piece. Everyone knows this work, not necessarily as a Leonardo, though Leonardo da Vinci's influence is very important. It's known as the Mona Lisa. I would say that title, it's quite important for it to be also anecdotal something you can identify with. Mona Lisa is quite international um, as a word co compared to La Gioconda. And also, it's a work that has strong authenticity, uh, a, a long story of, 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 of possession through the generations that proves its value. It was with the um, French royal family. It's been, how do you say that? Heatedly contested that it should go back to Italy because it's originally Italian. Even George Clooney's getting into the debate um, <laughs> a month ago, saying that she, she should go back to Italy. So uh, we're talking about something beyond just the artist's work. It's these specific works that create, um, create specific um, attachments. Uh, if we look at another work by Leonardo, um, this is called the Salvatore Mundi. Uh, it was exhibited at the National Gallery a few years ago. In the 50s, this specific work was sold for 45 pounds. It was then uh, found by a group of dealers who exhibited it in the National Gallery, and it's reputedly been sold last year um, for over $75 million. Now, uh, what's my point? <laughs> uh, it's similar to the Mona Lisa, this work is now important, but the difference is that the authenticity hasn't been there the whole time and the provenance has not been there the whole time. So while $75 million is a lot, 
The Mona Lisa's insurance value is currently the highest in the world, seven, $750 million. So if you think about it, this is benefiting from the words spoken about Leonardo, but it's different from the Mona Lisa in that it doesn't have those words written about that specific work that the Mona Lisa has. It's beyond the composition, which is just as beautiful. It's about what people have been saying about it throughout the centuries. So going back to it, it's a, it's a trio. You kind of have to think about it as being three different things that create those masterworks that all of a sudden are sold for incredible amounts of money. I'm not saying I agree or I don't agree. I actually don't sell art anymore. And, um, just exhibit it, so luckily I don't have to deal with all these big numbers. But the nice thing is to understand that it's not just about people throwing money around, it's also about the collective consciousness and what has been said about the works of art that are important to us, that are creating value through words. Let's go back to Cezanne and apply those three terms to this painting. Originally I was talking about the tension between the figures, the paint, the composition. But now let's talk about the title, the card players. It's accessible. It's something people can understand, people can relate to, and it feels quite great. Also, it's a series of five. So when it comes to provenance and authenticity, it's pretty clear that this is one of the works that's most important to Suzanne. He's repeated the subject over and over again. Then let's think about context. The other four works are in the Barnes Foundation in the States, the um, Musée d'Orsay in Paris, the Metropolitan Museum of New York, and the Courtauld Gallery here in London. So all of a sudden, this is the only work on the private, uh, private market of those five. It's in a context where everyone else has spoken about this work, despite um, it not being in a big national gallery, it's benefiting from those words. And lastly, let's talk about the artist. Cezanne, during his lifetime, was quite known. He was a friend of Pizarro. He uh, exhibited with the Impressionists. But at the end of the day, what really changed him from being a great artist to a master artist was not during his lifetime. He was uh, remembered as a melancholic guy, was a bit moody. But what really changed the way that people saw him was that after his death in 1907, there was a massive retrospective of his work that the Cubists all attended. And they actually wrote that he was the best artist of them all. So it was the words of subsequent generations that changed how he was seen throughout history. So if you use these three um, different ways of looking at work, you can really understand where we're coming from with the value of art. Um, thank you very much.